you probably know that most of the current web is actually running by open source software. And uh, of course, I can now try to, um, to scrap, to try to, to, to make sense of the, of the 100,000 of sites which exist. Or another strategy is I can specifically target the open source software tools that exist, things like PHP BB or Mailman or uh, WordPress or whatever exists. And if I'm able to infect, if I'm able to get data exporters in these particular software sites, I'm able to actually generate hundreds of thousands and change hundreds of thousands of sites at the same time, meaning I'm able to get to generate a critical mass very rapidly. And that is very close to, to what happened with the original web. You may know that the web didn't just come by itself. There was a process, a process of social engineering, where people actually started to, to set up server because it was cool, and installed a browser because they, they saw some cool content. And, and per, per, small by small, this started to grow into the web that we, what we saw today. And very, something very similar still works and is still in force with things like RSS, for example. So, and we try to investigate how this actually works on the web currently. And we have, we have been um, able to, to get quite some traction so far. So we impl implemented a couple of, uh, of open source uh, or tools or exporters for open source software, so for Drupal, PHP, BB, WordPress, or, and dot .clear. And the interesting aspect now is now people start to, to implement their own exporters for other software sites because they are able to see that this could make a lot of sense, that it gives them more exposure, for example. So as an example, if you look at pingthesemanticweb.com, you see that right now, Shock uh, has 165,000 instances somewhere on the web, which is, of course, in, uh, regarding the total scale of the web, still tiny. But the point is, it's growing, and it's growing quite fast. Um, the next step regarding, regarding uh, Shock, what we are now aiming to do is uh, we take three popular semantic web vocabularies, like for example, Shock and Fove and SCOS, uh, declare how they actually relate to each other, and then later on put onion rings of additional vocabularies in it, like for example, RDF calendars or something derived from microformats, and come up with, with, with a crystallization point for vocabulary and for schema development, so that all these different schemas are interrelated to each other, and the people who are actually looking searching for a specific application, for a specific vocabulary, are able to see exactly what they can use and what not. Uh, which brings me to the end already. We'll pass on to Eyal, who will uh, then talk more about other practical aspects of semantic web development. Thanks. OK. So hi, uh, my name is Eyal. Uh, and we do this presentation in three pieces. So Stefan did a piece, I will do quickly a piece, and then Sebastian will do his piece. And we'll take a questions at the end, and you can ask across all the different stuffs. So I'll present very quickly, because we have only little time, uh, two techniques uh, uh, for more practical application development. And both techniques actually tie into Ruby on Rails, which if you know about it or if you use it, is quite uh, nice, because it actually gives you a very practical way to deploy semantic web in an application very quickly. Um, and if you want more details, I, I will skim through it. More details you can read in the papers, and I will give you the links later. So if you look uh, on a kind of typical database-driven web application, right? not, not always, but typically, uh, it's a centralized application where you basically have one point of control. That's the application. There is a fixed schema that you decide upon uh, at design time, then there is a fixed vocabulary that you choose for your application. You have this central point of publishing, one point of control, one data source. It's basically a closed system, right? It's your system, it's your data, it's your app. Then if you look at uh, semantic web applications, or if you think the whole semantic web is just a hype, just replace web 2.0 applications there, there are more open systems. They are decentralized. The data can be across different sources. It's semi-structured data. You don't get to decide upfront which data will be in there because it's not one point of control. So it doesn't make sense to have a very strict schema because you cannot enforce the schema if you don't have one point of control. So you have arbitrary vocabulary because people can do whatever they want and you can publish anywhere 
and you need to crawl or somehow figure out where this data is and aggregate all these distributed data sources. So you have open systems like mashups where you basically uh, pick and combine data from all kind of various spaces. And if you want to build applications that do this kind of open systems, it gets a bit harder because you don't have control over your data. So I will talk uh, very briefly about Active RDF, which is a mapping from RDF data, or graph data, into OO, because OO programming is what most people are actually used to, and it also helps you to reuse basically existing software stacks. And then afterwards, I will talk very briefly about a facet and navigation technique that you can use to explore this kind of arbitrary data that you can find when you integrate arbitrary sources. So the motivation, if, if you look at traditional database-driven web applications, you typically have a database. On top of the database, you have object relational mappings. And on top of those, so those basically translate the tuples into OO instances. And on top of those, you have web application frameworks that help you do the more mundane tasks of, of web development, like caching, authorization, routing, and so on. And so you have all these frameworks recently uh, like Rails, Django, Zen, Struts, Nitro, and so on and so on, that helps you to do this. And only thing, or only thing, the, the important thing you need to do here is you need to translate or map the relational data into an OO setting, and then these applications can work. Now, if you look at semantic web data, we actually have quite a lot of data right now online, and it's growing very fast. And if you were at the last uh, WWW conference, you could have uh, learned about this linking open data initiative where people try to take all kinds of openly available uh, free data sources and convert them into RDF and actually interlink them. And there is huge data sets now available, such as, for example, DBpedia, which tries to extract uh, structured information out of Wikipedia, out of the info boxes, and interlink them with geodata, for example, with music data, and so on and so on. And shock, obviously, is, is, is one of these sources of data that we have. So we have a lot of data. Uh, we have a lot of uh, data stores, so comparable to, say, a database. You know, you can download all this data, get it somewhere, crawl it, and, and, and store it locally. And then what? So you have data, but data doesn't make an application. So what would be very nice if you could reuse these kind of web application frameworks to help you to do this stuff on the web, actually. And what you would need to do that is ActiveRDF, which is then what I will now talk very briefly about, that basically translates this uh, RDF graph data into OO and helps you reuse uh, frameworks such as Ruby on Rails. And if you're a Python programmer, you would need to do some similar thing like I did for ActiveRDF for Python, but it's very small, it's very simple, and once you figure out how to do it, it's not so difficult, actually. So intuitively, this is the mapping from RDF, RDFS data to OO. Now, this only works intuitively. It actually doesn't really work. But I won't go into detail why this doesn't work. You can read the paper about the problems and the solutions. But intuitively, you can say, you know, RDF and RDF schema defines classes, right? So, so this we can map to OO classes. In RDF, we have resources, which we can map to OO objects, so instances for classes. And in RDF, we have triples uh, that make basically statements about resources. And those we can map to OO attribute values and relation, uh, relationships. So if you have here a very simple RDF uh, schema in N3, so if you don't know this, it doesn't really matter too much, but it says that a person is a class John is a person, and John has named John Breslin. So this is a snippet of RDF. And you could map this intuitively to a, to a kind of UML diagram where you have this person class and this John instance, OK? That's intuitively. And that's what you want to appear for the OO programmer. If he can work with this, and he doesn't even know that in the background there is RDF graph data that is interlinked with other data sets, that's very nice. Except, again, what I said, it doesn't really work like this, but you can make it look as if it works. So the examples is you get Ruby code that looks like this. Uh, if you know Ruby code, um, this is quite easy to follow. If you don't know, it may be a little bit more tricky. Uh, but basically, this is active RDF, right? So this is a mapping layer. This is RD you're actually doing RDF programming here. But you, you, maybe you don't realize it. You say, give me John and everybody he knows. And then for everybody he knows, print the name of that friend, right? So you're basically traversing the graph and you're operating on, on the resources you find in the graph. And here, you, for example, you say, find me all persons named John, or find me all persons named John and age 30. And so what you, what you do here is similar to what relational mappers do for relational data. You hide, basically, the fact that you're talking to tuples, and you hide. There is no SQL here. There is no Sparkle. Uh, but you're doing RDF manipulations. 
And you can do this in a read and in a write mode, obviously. So the architecture of ActiveRDF, very briefly, is a kind of a layered architecture where we tackle different problems on different layers. So if you're an application developer, you sit on the top and you only talk to this object manager. And this object manager is what you just saw before. This is the one that wraps basically RDF resources and classes as OO objects. So you get kind of proxies that you talk to. And then behind the scenes, everything is converted into manipulations on the graph. To do this, we have all kinds of different data stores, and data sources, sorry. And these can be stored in all kinds of different data stores. But we, in, in the semantic web world, we have not reached a point where things are standardized. So all these different stores all have their different API. They all have their different query language. There is a standard query language now, but it's read-only. So you basically have to do all kinds of specific manipulations for depending on the data source that you're talking to. So we have these adapters that abstract, basically, from the, from the different stores that we talk to. Then we have a federation manager that allows you to query and manipulate data from uh, distributed sources at the same time. And then there is an abstract query engine that, again, abstracts from all these different query languages that are out there and allows you basically from the top down to talk to all these different sources without really caring about their different uh, peculiarities. So this object manager, like I said, this is what you, what you talk to when you're doing application development. So if you know, if you know Rails, this is your model, right? This is how you talk to, to, to your data. So you basically you have proxy objects like John here, and you call methods on, on these proxy objects, and these methods are caught behind the scene, and they are uh, intercepted and changed into queries or, or into updates on the data. So this would query for the, for the name of John. This would update the, the set of people that John knows and add Jack to it. And this would find you all the people, and so on and so on. And then we have these adapters that wrap all kinds of data sources and, and abstract them to the, to the higher layer. And the interesting thing is that you obviously you can use these adapters also to wrap non-RDF data. So you can basically take application data or file system metadata like Spotlight uh, and, and wrap it and make it look on the, up, on, the bottom, uh, on the top layer to be RDF data, although it's not natively RDF. So you, you're getting queries, you rewrite them into some application-specific uh, manipulations, and you generate RDF to go, to go up again. And so what this gives you is you can use this framework to manipulate basically all kinds of uh, linked data, not necessarily RDF data. Okay, and then as I said, unfortunately this intuitive mapping that I showed you doesn't really work. So actually it's not as simple as it seems right now. And um, basically the whole problem is that OO and RDF, RDFS live in completely separate worlds. So in OO, class definitions are basically templates in at least statically typed OO languages. So you define a class and then the instances have to follow the properties and the behavior of that class. And you cannot have instances that look different than the class. And if you look in RDF and RDFS, actually the whole notion of a schema is the other way around. Basically, when any resource can have any, any properties, you can attach any property to any resource in RDF. What, you, what, what happens is that you can look at these instances and then determine to which classes they belong. So it's a bottom-up uh, approach. And, and these mismatches uh, cause several, several problems, and I won't go into detail, but you can read uh, our dub, dub, dub paper uh, if you want to know what exactly the problems are and how to address them, and, and actually why Ruby is a very nice language to address them. Okay, now I will try to briefly show you some um, uh, kind of related uh, work that helps you in navigating this data. So again, remember, like I said in the beginning, the world becomes interesting when you have open systems, open data, and you get data from other sources that are actually not under your control. So it's a bit hard to navigate data that you don't know the schema of up front, and you don't know the structure of this data, but you will still want to allow people to navigate through this data. And so faceted navigation is quite a successful uh, UI metaphor or UI technique for navigating large information spaces. So if you know iTunes, and I guess you do, then, then you know facet navigation. Basically, you have your whole music collection, all your songs, and it's basically divided in three facets, orthogonal facets, right? So you can either filter on the genre of the, of the song, so like classical, techno, or pop, rock, whatever, or on the artist, so Britney Spears or Madonna or Beck, or on the album. And basically, if you, if you select as choice, your music collection will be filtered down to whatever matches the choice. And actually, the other facets will also be filtered down. So if you select Madonna, 
you won't see, for example, techno in the genre because Madonna didn't make any techno music. So you basically do a, um, um, you constrain all the facets in any order that you want, they adapt to each other, and your information space becomes smaller and smaller until you find the song that you're looking for. So that's a very nice technique to, to browse your information collection, and it's especially very nice when you're in a party, right? Because if this is your music, you typically know what music you have. But if you're in a party, you don't know what this guy has for music. So you can scroll through the 50,000 songs that this guy found somewhere, but it takes you a long time to figure out actually what is the music. And depending on what is available, maybe your requirements will lower a little bit. So if you figure out the guy doesn't really have exactly the music you want, you will settle for something else. But settling for something else, you can only do if you can actually browse it and see it and see what's there. So that's why this is a very nice technique to figure out large information spaces that you do not know up front, right? Now, the only downside to this is that it only works for a certain domain, right? So in music and iTunes, you have genre, artist, and album as the facets, basically, right? But if you go to a library and you take iTunes and just stick in bibliographic information in there, it won't work because books don't have an artist necessarily, or it's called at least different. Books are not collected by album. And if you put in recipes, it gets in even worse. So you cannot browse recipes in, in iTunes because recipes have ingredients or maybe a cuisine or maybe calories. So you need to adjust the facets. But not all facets are interesting, right? So you cannot just take kind of all the metadata you have about this thing and, and, and build a faceted interface around it. So you have to somehow figure out what are the interesting pieces and what are not, and that's what iTunes does manually for you. But this means that every time you find a new domain, you have to manually create the interface. Second problem is that data is usually interconnected, right? It's a graph. But the facet of browsing, at least like you have in iTunes, it doesn't really exploit this. So basically, it focuses on homogeneous data, songs, and then it focuses on one type of resource, and then you can only show facets of those songs. So it's, it's artist and it's album. But you cannot search in iTunes for all songs written by a UK artist because it doesn't actually know that these artists are from the UK. But even if the data was in there that uh, Britney Spears is American, iTunes doesn't let you to, to make these kind of uh, joint constraints. So you can, you can filter, say, on all things written by Stefan, but you cannot filter on all things written by somebody who is 30 because this interconnectedness of the data that's not reflected in the user interface. So if you look on semantic web data and this graph data, facet browsing, I mean, it's, it's basically very simple. It's query construction, right? If this is the graph, then this is kind of the query. You select something and you, and you basically build, build the constraints on the where clause. So basically, the information space that you're talking about are sets of triples. The ele element of interest are a set of subjects, so things we are looking for. And the facets that we want to find are the properties, the outgoing arcs, right? So now let's look a little bit on the, on the operators we can build that are a bit, maybe a bit richer than what, what iTunes offers you. So we have identified these uh, kind of uh, several operators that you can combine. So you have this basic selection, basically key value, right? So I'm looking for all things age 30. We have more an existential selection, so I'm looking for things or people basically that are unmarried, don't have a spouse, and you can do joins over the graph. So I'm looking for somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who's called Stefan, okay? And then you can obviously combine these in an the intersection, so you, you, you combine uh, these three, so I'm looking for a 30-year-old unmarried person who knows Stefan in some second degree. And then it's very important to realize that in an RDF graph and in, in, a, in a directed graph, the, the direction of the, the, the arrows is usually qu quite arbitrary. It just depends on the guy who wrote the graph if he goes in the one direction or in the other direction. But very often you want to query the graph in the other direction than the data is. So if I have data saying dairy employs somebody, I want to I want to find everybody employed by dairy, or I want to find everybody who is employed by somebody, right? So everybody who is not unemployed, or I want to find everybody employed by some company in Ireland. So you have basically the same operators, but they go in the other direction, and you can obviously intersect them as well. So now uh, I have very little time left, so let me just go briefly to the ranking, because we talked. So basically the. The, the steps you do in a kind of a facet navigation algorithm is you, you select the resources, right? So these are all the things under consideration. So when you start, it's basically the whole music collection. But then when you filter on the genre, it's a smaller set of the music collection. Okay, so this is the first thing you do. You build kind of the resources under consideration. Then you look at the facets in that collection. So this would be basically the outgoing properties. And then you want to rank the facets because, as I said, not all these facets are really interesting. 
and you want to somehow figure out if you can automatically find these facets. So select resources, select all subjects for a certain constraint. Then the outgoing arcs is select all the predicates for the same constraints. And now let's look a little bit about this ranking. So basically, if you realize that faceted navigation is basically constructing and at the same time navigating a decision tree. So when I, for example, have this bibliographic information, I say, okay, I want to first filter everybody, all the things written by Stefan, so off a Decker, and in those set, I want to filter everything written then in the year 2000, and then I basically find he wrote three, or he wrote papers on three topics that year, okay? So I'm basically browsing through the decision tree, and maybe if I select this, I will kind of see, see the information space, and here the information space I see at this point is, is larger, and up there is even larger. But then, the order in which I apply these facets while I'm browsing affects the decision tree, because I could also first select a year. So I'm just looking at all publications in the year 2000, then I'm looking at the topic, and those are different topics, right, because I didn't say yet that I'm looking only at Stefan's papers. So then I select logics, and then I could find Stefan in there. So there's a different way to get to maybe the same information. And that basically gives you a, uh, a hint on what you could do to, to rank these facets is you can look at a kind of optimal decision tree uh, construction where the decision tree basically affects the efficiency of navigating to, to some resource in your information space. So basically, we uh, identified three uh, properties you can rank on, three metrics you can rank on. So first one is actually more from a user interface perspective is that the cardinality of the facet, so the choice, number of choice values you have so if you have to choose from 300 authors, that's quite difficult, first of all, UI-wise. But also, once you choose one of the authors, you're basically going very deep down into the, into the information space. So versus if you have to choose from five publishers, the chance is, first of all, it's easier to pick from five publishers, like from five music genres. Also, the chance is that your, uh, your information resource that you're looking for is in, those, in one of those five is obviously higher than if one of from the 300. So this is kind of the uh, formula that goes with that. You can read, again, this, I give you at the end links to the papers so you can read more in detail there. Then you have basically the balance of the, of the information resources under each of the choices that you have. So say if we look at publishers, right? So this is, again, bibliographic data. So if you look at a set of papers, if 82 of them are published by the Springer company, right? And uh, the rest of all the companies only have 18% of the papers. Right? And selecting publisher as a kind of a point to decide right now is not very optimal because the tree is very unbalanced. Whereas if you take a, a, a facet like topic, which may be more evenly distributed, then that is right now a more efficient choice because it basically uh, uh, the information gain in every choice will be higher. And lastly, this is semi-structured data. So not all the properties apply to all the resources. So there may be books and songs and people and recipes there. So you can look at basically the frequency of facets occurring. So right, so again in papers, location of a paper is usually not given, whereas authors of papers are usually given. So you can basically look at how often the facets occur, and the ones that occur very infrequently are basically not so useful to select on because again you will drill down either very deeply in, into the space or you will stay very high at the top. So that you can combine basically in a kind of a simple ranking uh, metric, and then you can automatically construct the interface for arbitrary data where you basically rank the facets uh, based on the data that you actually have under consideration. So you don't need to predefine this interface for, for certain domains. So I had a quick uh, demo. Uh, should I? Okay. I can show this very quickly, but I have to just switch the, the computer. The, the shock stuff that Stefan was talking about. So just a little bit of explanation. Yeah, this is okay. So what we're looking at here, this is a kind of an RSS feed reader plus plus. So we have shock data, what Stefan was uh, explaining, that comes from all kinds of community sites, so forums, blogs, wikis, or actually not wikis, but mailing lists, um, and we aggregate them, okay? So this is just a very simple uh, prototype application. And we aggregate this, uh, this data, and we build a simple kind of feed reader on top of that using ActiveRDF, 
So this, this is built on Ruby on Rails and Active RDF and using the facet navigation, which we will show in a sec see in a second. So you can basically read a certain, uh, a certain form, and this then comes from a, from a blog of somebody. So we aggregate these, these blog posts, and you see the replies basically from this guy, and you see some metadata there at the top, and here are all his posts, and here is basically the, the facets that we found in this small information space. So this is basically his, uh, his blog data. So you see he published in this export in two years, in 2006 and 2007, in all kinds of topics and so on and so on. So we can, we can just read a couple of posts, eh? Just look through these posts. And then we can do kind of lateral browsing, where you, for example, like in a, in a, in a feed reader, you could do the same. You could uh, click on a tag and, and jump to, to all the posts described by the tag. But now we have much richer metadata from all these sites, because all these sites are exporting shock metadata. So we can, for example, uh, jump to all kind of posts written in that month. So now we're looking at, at posts from all kinds of forums in February 2007, and, and now this one comes from a guy named Fred, and we can read through that. And, and you see that we have all kinds of topics mentioned there. But these can very, be very rich facets, right? Because Shock can export very rich metadata. So Shock can export, for example, metadata about the authors and their workplace. So now we can filter all the posts to people that work in Ireland, for example. So I can read only blog posts from people in Ireland, which is something that is not so easy to do with the normal RSS feed because this information is not in the feed. But now people can choose what information about themselves they want to export. So now we're looking at Fred, and uh, we can basically see some information about him. And we're now looking at all the posts from Fred, and we see there were some replies to his posts. So we can basically jump through the through the blogosphere or through the boardscape here. And I don't actually know where this information came from. So not all this came from blog posts. There is also information from mailing lists, from IRC. There are also, also people doing Twitter exports and so on and so on. And you can aggregate all this easily. And the only thing I wanted to say, you can forget about the user interface, right? I mean, it's about the engine under it. But the whole thing, including the crawling, the, the logic, the facets, and so on, is all written in uh, 250 or 300 lines of code. Uh, using Ruby on Rails. So that's one of the powers you get when you build on such a framework is that you can reuse a lot of stuff and you don't need to actually do a lot of work. So this is very simple to build. Okay, with that I will just hand back to Sebastian. And he will show you something about uh, more general uh, forms of uh, knowledge collection and knowledge sharing. Thanks, Ayel. Uh, my name is Sebastian, and uh, I'm working in Derry on the e-learning project and dealing with uh, digital libraries as one of my aspects. What I would like to show you today is uh, the, the problems that we have about sharing and interconnecting knowledge and uh, how they can be solved with the techniques that were presented before. So uh, if we look at the, uh, at the uh, the knowledge that uh, we are trying to acquire uh, using, for example, internet techniques, there are two problems uh, that has to be addressed. First of all, how to uh, aggregate and how to interconnect all the, the different sources coming from different, uh, different sources. So how to interconnect all the information. Um, the, the second thing is, the second question is, how to actually share this, this knowledge with, uh, with the larger community and how to actually learn it from this community. And uh, I will be presenting this uh, uh, quite a general topic in one specific field, which is digital libraries, because you, you can understand that libraries are actually the largest, the oldest uh, source of information. So before the internet came, there were always libraries. There were always a place where you went to uh, to learn something. Now, in the in the in the old days, uh, the the libraries were the, the the place where people meet. Now, when the internet came, a lot of libraries started to expose their resources on the internet, which ended up in, of course, better accessibility of the content, but it uh, had some drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks were that the the user is now a lonely user, so you can search for something, but you are just sitting beside your computer. You don't meet people, you can't actually share your experience, you can learn from the others. And uh, if you are not talking about the libraries of tomorrow, so all the new 
uh, aspects you would like to address and uh, would like to help people is that first of all, we, we would like to build on the top of existing metadata a semantic description so that the metadata is not just a v uh, property value pair, but it's interconnected. Then uh, we would like to allow users to share their experience by the annotations uh, provided by, the, by themselves and eventually to allow them to search and browse in collaborative fashion so that uh, instead of having this librarian in the library, we could, sh we could learn from our peers how to actually find something in the library. So uh, if we go now uh, to the list of the features that, that can support it, is that first of all, the semantics are one of the ways to interconnect the information. Then we need to allow users to start uh, contributing uh, to the classification process because this is the only way when they will understand the classification instead of just accepting what the librarians does, did and it, it was very hard to understand. And eventually, it's, we, we need to make libraries a part of the larger uh, set of services on the internet like blogs, wikis, and so on. And uh, the RDF is one of the uh, one of the techniques to, to bind it all together. So uh, the prototype that we built in Derry and, uh, is, is Jerome DL. It's, uh, it's a digital library that operates on semantics, but also delivers uh, community profiles. So it supports users and communities uh, with delivering and sharing knowledge, and it transforms the existing metadata standards like Dublin Core, BeepTech, and Mart21 into interconnected semantics. So if you look at the very generic architecture, we have three layers. The very bottom layer is the existing digital library. Now, what is interesting for us is the semantic layer where we actually start interconnecting uh, the data, uh, interconnecting the meta information, and you deliver services on the top of it. So one of the services uh, is something that AL already presented, is how to actually browse the data. Now the question is why to do it? Well, actually because the search does not end with a long list of results. The second problem is that once we have the semantics, we have more power because we are resulting with a graph. But in order to, to, to search of the graph, we can get lost in a hyperspace. And even if in the normal internet, when you traverse the links from page to page, you can quickly get lost there. So we need the better unified user interface and a set of services that will allow us to browse through this information. And uh, of course, it would be nice to share our experience with the others so that we could help someone else and someone else could help us in finding the information. Now, how are we gonna do this? Uh, with all the services that are recently published online, you know this Web 2.0 hype, uh, you will notice that a lot of them are published with the REST type of web services. So we decided to use this technique to expose, first of all, the very basic services like access to the resource, search for the resources, filter, find similar resources, browse through the RDF data, and combine different results. We have also allowed meta services like RDF serialization, subscription channels, and generating ID. And eventually we have some context services that allows users to track their, uh, track their history of, uh, of actions and quickly go back to what they found some time ago and share this experience with, with their friends. And also a couple of statistic services. So this is the multi-B browse, a component uh, that will be deployed pretty soon in Jerome and it's already available online for testing where Jerome can start exploiting the data and uh, the, the interconnected data by, for example, going to specific resource, finding similar resources, and eventually it allows you to browse the resources that are uh, well, better interconnected than just a simple metadata. Now, if you look at the higher level, uh, the higher level layer on, uh, in our architecture, which is a community layer, uh, there are a certain number of services that are delivered to the community so that, first of all, we can extend the existing metadata with the metadata delivered by the users, and second of all, we can allow users to build uh, a community and to share knowledge on the top of it. So, and the question is why we need to build such a channel, uh, such a notion of, of collaborative, uh, collaborative browsing, collaborative experience, is that because even if we think about our normal use of computers, our normal use of internet, 
very often we end up using this informal knowledge, word of mouth. So we end we just can't find something on the internet, we either go to our colleagues or we are uh, ending up in the community portals. And how we can do it? First of all, we have to allow users to classify the information. So, so allow users to do their own description, that the kind of description they can understand. And the second thing is we need to allow users to share it. And the result? The result is that uh, the knowledge flows from the domain expert to the user, because if I start subscribing to some knowledge of my peers, because I consider them to uh, have more expertise on certain topic, and they do the same, uh, eventually, uh, at the end of the line, there is an expert from which I can learn. And the second thing is that we build up a better user and a community profile on which other services can operate more, uh, more precisely. Now, there are a couple of problems. First of all is the horizon of a social network. So we usually, usually we don't see or we don't trust people that are further than two or three degrees of separation. So we wouldn't trust this kind of a source. We wouldn't, we wouldn't even connect to this. And the second thing is if we deal with fine grade information like blocks and wikis, pointing just to a site might not be a good idea because if I just point to, to a post, I might not see the other posts, I not see the, the interconnected, I not see the, the structure of the post. So what are the solutions? The, first, the solution to the first problem is to, to deliver a, a suggestion and recommendation engine that we have in social semantic collaborative filtering uh, that finds other people uh, based on certain properties, for example, that you work with the same institute but you just have never met. I think Google is a good example, having 12,000 people working in the same company. And the second solution is to use shock metadata to actually exploit this fine-grained information. Now, a simple example of the social semantic collaborative filtering is when you have a social network like this and Alice is interested in bibliographic ontologies metadata, she has two friends, Bob and Caroline, they classify information, artificial intelligence, digital libraries, distributed systems, and Caroline has another two friends, Damien and Eric, and they are interested in libraries, peer-to-peer -peer system, and semantic web. If we now see the social network between Alice, Bob, Caroline, Damien, and Eric, we can also see how they can interconnect and how they can subscribe to the information filtered by somebody else. So eventually what we got is that some information classified by Eric can go up the stream to, to Alice. The same thing can happen with the information classified by Bob, and Alice is learning from the experience of her friends. And uh, now the summary. I'm giving to Stefan. There you go. There you go. What I tried to give you here was a short, uh, well, only a few selection of the technologies that, that we are developing in, within the Institute. And I hope you got an impression that the semantic web is a bit more than hype, that actually there's something happening. Uh, we did not go in, into much detail on presenting what actually is out there on the web. I mean, you can look for yourself what kind of data sources you are able to find. And what you will find if you look deeply enough is a very active community and something that actually is growing, which means um, there's now um, uh, Metcalf's law kicks in, which means you have, you have a very high growth rates in, in terms of data. So it would be something to watch out for. Um, yeah, in terms of... Uh, Available technologies, what we have presented, I mean, you are able to look at, for example, the Shock Project, uh, Semantic Interlink of Online Communities, um, at shockproject.org, uh, the data mapping, the Ruby on Rails library is available under activerdf.org, there's a digital library which uh, incorporates some of the things that you have talked about at jeromedl.org, faceted navigation um, interface that you have seen is available under browserdf.org, and uh, social knowledge sharing, as, uh, again, it's a library component, which if you would like to explore it, is available at uh, s3b.corib.org. And much more information about the Institute. Again, this is only a small selection of things that, that, that we are doing, and, and we are getting uh, uh, also quite some interest uh, from companies. We are working together with Cisco, with Nortel, with Ericsson um, on some of the technologies uh, under dairy.ie. So thanks again for your attention. It's time to wake up again, and we're happy to, to take some questions.
find a few ontologies um, for content generate. Hello? No. Yeah. I know you need to find a few ontologies for content generation, but what work are you doing to, um, to expand content generation uh, outside of just uh, adding things to programs for automatic content generation? So one, one of the problems of the, of the early semantic web development was indeed to assume that the user would generate too much content, which, which was never true, which was ever always always wrong because at the end of the day it was too, too much work. Now, it, the, 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 the coming uh, the arrival of things like, or a site like Technorati uh, with, um, um, with uh, the, the, the effect of, of tagging change that a bit. So users are now willing to put some, to put some more effort into it. They're classifying, they're tagging the information. So something, some more content is coming up. So however, still, for me, the most promising aspect is to exploit the structure that's already there, which is in, hidden inside the rational databases. And getting this con interconnected by, is for me the first, the first aspect. And there's a lot of a lot of structured data already available, which just is waiting to be interconnected, to be, to be interlinked with, with other information. So that, for me, is indeed the most promising part. Now, if you look around what kind of other data you will find, you will find this very specialized community, communities, so islands of information, which is just now waiting to be interconnected. For example, in the life sciences community, and they're very, very much interested because they have many, many different information sources. It's a highly collaborative task, task and they have no idea how to share this information. Really, so that is a very promising area, and so many people are recognizing this as an, as, an, as an area. So again, this information is becoming available quite rapidly. So again, for me, the most promising task is to exploit the structure, the information that is already there. Any other questions? So one problem that I, I'm not really sure, but I think one problem that might be with uh, most collaborative networks of this sort is that there's too much information and in the, uh, the time actually taken to update this information when any changes actually occur in the actual data are actually constructing the initial, um, you know, the initial network itself may be too large to actually do it in reality as of today. So how, how exactly is that being addressed when you're doing this? So the information that we are currently exploiting is generated out of relational databases, which means, for example, if you're talking about uh, information which you publish in a blog, et cetera, and you have updates, for example, do an update in your blog, then automatically it will become available even in, in, in your updated data, in, in, in the updated version. Um, I'm not sure what, what other data you, you mean or... When you're trying to generalize it over all the data sources that are available over the internet today, and you're trying to collaboratively connect them, yeah. how would it actually work when you're trying to do it on a regular basis? Oh, uh, okay, so uh, I guess uh, the, the the question is to how do you guarantee quest, how do do you guarantee freshness? Yeah. And okay, so, so they are. And I guess Google has very much the same problem at the end of the day. Namely, websites are being updated if you want to index them. So how do you guarantee freshness? So the question that I can pose back, so how does Google currently solve the problem? And I guess the idea is that you either crawl um, regularly, and there are some sites that you crawl more often than after others based on the importance and based on the amount of updates that a certain site or a certain information source will get. Or, and that's the other solution, you revert completely to distributed querying, which is something that, that this would also allow, allow to do. That means you, you're querying on demand a, a particular site, which uh, with Sparkle endpoints, and, and so endpoints services which provide you with direct programmatic access to the information source um, would, would allow you to enable. So in, in effect, it's the same problem that exists right now on, on the web, um, only that um, with... Um, uh, Sparkle endpoints, you, you may have a direct service and query interface, which you could uh, use to, to have a direct querying system as well. But it, it, once you rely on centralized infrastructures, like, for example, a crawler, as we did in our examples, the same problems exist as, as in Google, which means you need to crawl quite regularly. Any other questions? 
Um, one of the really interesting things about the semantic web is that you can, ex uh, you can, um, you can infer things based upon, uh, so you don't just have attributes, you have, you have relationships between things, and so you can infer things based upon these relationships. So um, most of the querying that I saw were basically attribute-based queries. That's correct. Um, what is, but th there's a lot more interesting queries that you can do uh, than just attribute-based queries, right? So how, how, are, how would that fit in? So, <laughs> sorry, before we start talking about semantics, although you're right, uh, stuff you saw was not attributes, it was interlinked. So it, there is a very big difference between key value pairs and interlinked data. And for example, this facet navigation that I show, or the stuff that Sebastian showed, was uh, data that you can filter on or navigate on in multiple levels of the hierarchy, so you can browse through the graph. So it's not simple attribute value pairs, although it might look that way, but it's interlinked data. So that's, that's first. The second question is, don't you want to do stuff with the logics that you have in this model? Don't you want to exploit this further? Right? Because you, you can do more than just following the explicit information, right? So do you want to? Yeah. I mean, I have no... So, so we, we, we left out on purpose for a specific reason. So from my perspective, the core of the semantic web is not necessarily logics or derived information. It's, it's a part of it. But too much emphasis in the past has been put into logics and reasoning and derivation. Or not, not much em emphasis or not, not enough has been put on what you actually can do with the generator, what is the real purpose of the data, and, and how do you actually gen generate it. And that problem needs to be resolved first before you actually can, and, and the point is you can do quite useful things with, just with the plain interlinked data source ra rather than regarding on, or relying on, on, on reasoning. Reasoning adds a, a whole new chapter, especially in terms of, of um, um, scalability. Um, issues and um, you, you can apply if you, if you look at, for example, deductive database techniques. You can uh, apply some basic reasoning techniques, like for example the resolution of transitivity, um, which gives you, a, for example, a subclass hierarchy, which can be done quite scalable, and people can do that, and it gives you a lot of um, um, actually interesting information as well. Um, too much emphasis has in the past to, to be put on description logics, which, from my perspective, are too complicated. On also. Not, not, really, not, not really relevant um, to the problem. So that has diverted a lot from what the real potential of interlinked data on the web really is. Um, so in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, reasoning and derivation and inferencing is an aspect, but it's a small aspect, has been overestimated in the past, and let's concentrate on making use of the data that exists right now that can be deployed and try to generate more interlinked data, because that is something that really is interesting, that can derive businesses and additional value for a user. Okay, so we are uh, out of time, so let's thank uh, uh, Stefan, Eyal, and Sebastian.